Well, I was going to have to hustle through my slides, so you'll just have to bear with me. Uh, the presentation is intended to be reference material. I was going to go through it pretty fast anyways. Uh, Google is your friend. If there's something on there you don't understand, I'm going to try and explain very, you know, 10,000 foot view, but um, uh, it should be uh, fairly clear if you actually are interested in the topic and want to dig in. Um, you can find all this material, uh, explanations of what they are on the web. It doesn't seem to be working. So oh, sure, why not? So you're going to have to use a keypad. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I'm John Mahaffey. Um, I actually work for Mentor Graphics. Uh, I know the, the printed materials say I'm from Monte Vista, but probably you've heard that uh, the Mentor the, has acquired the Monte Vista Automotive Business Unit. Um, well, what's the best way to do this? There we go. So, um, in 2005, I was the Bomolytics architect for Monte Vista, uh, doing a lot of uh, mobile and, and power and fast boot and security sort of things for mobile phones. Um, after that, I was the automotive architect at Monte Vista. Uh, about a year ago, I became the security lead for Genevi, the system infrastructure expert group. So I'm working with the security team inside of Genevi to help define um, uh, automotive security. This talk is not about automotive security per se. Uh, it's, it's more for just uh, general embedded use. Um, as of about a month ago, I became the senior system architect for Mentor Embedded. Um, so this is about embedded systems. It's not about IT security. It's a very different beast. Uh, the key piece of IT security is that you have to have physical security. For an embedded device, you don't own the device. So physical security is not possible. In general, you're not protecting Fort Knox, so it's not as big a deal. You know, you don't have billions of dollars worth of uh, data riding on it. Um, if you are protecting Fort Knox, uh, there's a lot more you have to go through. Um, look up common criteria if you want to see what kind of pain you're in for. <clears throat> in general, hackers are a lazy breed. Um, they're going to go for low-hanging fruit. So this is intended to let you be not low-hanging fruit. There's an old joke about uh, a couple of campers who are confronted by an angry bear, and one of the campers sits down and starts tying his shoes. And the other camper goes, well, why are you tying your shoes? He says, well, you know, why are you tying shoes? You, you can't outrun that bear. And he goes, well, I don't have to outrun the bear. I only have to outrun you. <laughs> so... Um, you make your system hard, hard to hack, and, and they'll go after easier, easier things. A quick taxonomy of uh, black hats. Uh, generally, in the security community, they don't call them hackers. They, they, you know, they're, they're good hackers and bad hackers, and the bad hackers are called black hats. Uh, at the lowest level, they're called script kiddies. These are people who really don't know what they're doing. They found something interesting. Their friend told them about, you know, Metasploit or something, and, and they've tried it out, and, and wow, they got into somebody's system, and isn't this cool? And they're easily defended against, they're easily caught. Uh, the next level are what we call opportunists. They're people who are maybe insiders, who have inside information, and possibly an opportunity presents itself for them to um, use their information, possibly sell it, uh, you know, just, uh, there are bots scouring the net at all times, looking for vulnerabilities, looking for open ports. Um, that's another type of opportunist. Um, then there are the grudge hackers. These are people who are probably in the same category as script kiddies. They don't really know what they're doing, but they, they're motivated. They want to punish the company for laying them off or you know, the, uh, you know, whatever their, their grudge is. They're in general, a denial of service attack is fine for them. They're not a, that's not a profit motive. Uh, and then we have the organized black hats, um, uh, what they call a hacktivist, somebody who's got an ax to grind, uh, possibly denial of service is what they're after. They don't like Microsoft or they don't like, you know, Red Hat or whatever it is. Um, organized crime. So there's uh, well-funded organizations that create uh, botnets uh, within, um, you know, they actually spend money. They pay you, you know, if you, if you create a virus and you can create a botnet for them, they will pay you money for your botnet and then they can sell that to other uh, organized criminals. 
And then we have the nation states. So we all heard about the, uh, the Chinese uh, government hacking into the United States. Well, there's the United States and Israel hacking into Iran, and there's the Russian government. You know, it's, they, they call them nation states. Uh, government isn't uh, a broad enough term, apparently. So we'll get into the best practices talk. Um, I'm going to go over some design best practices. It starts at the root of trust. Um, if you don't, if you can't trust what operating system, if you can't trust your bootloader, then you can't trust it to bring in the right operating system. If you don't, can't trust your operating system, then your applications can't trust that they're going to be doing what you designed them to do. Um, so it all starts with a secure boot. Uh, there are many commercial uh, vendors of it. Uh, Arm has a trust zone. Uh, and you know, Freescale and TI and all the semiconductors, they've got their own versions of secure boot, but it starts with um, a root of trust. Um, you should, if, you have, if you're connecting to the internet in any significant way uh, and communicating things of value, you should have a hardware crypto module. Typically, it would have a cryptographic engine for encrypting and decrypting you would have some one-time programmable cryptographic keys, your, your, your secret master key. Um, don't use the same secret master key on every one of your devices. You know, the part of it is these keys are crackable. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But you don't want one cracked key to lead to a class of devices that are compromised. Uh, random number generator is a good thing to have. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of the communication protocols require good random numbers. Um, trusted boot we just talked about. Uh, One-time programmable data, things like serial numbers, you know, flags that you know, say what state the machine is in, those sorts of things. A monotonic counter so that you can tell if there's a man in the middle trying to spoof your, uh, your communication. Secure RAM for holding decrypted uh, information that you want to keep secure. Tamper detection to see if uh, you know if the device has been opened or possibly you know power glitches or over tamp things to try to create fault attacks. Um, other things are possible, so you you've, you've got to ask yourself how much are you willing to pay and and you know how how valuable is your data? But there's always a compromise. Um, you're going to want to harden your hardware, so I know a lot of you are are Linux hackers and believe firmly in the GPL v3. Uh, but often that's at odds with, um, you know, a secure device that needs to communicate with a secure infrastructure and is doing monetary type of transactions. Um, so it, by limiting access to the hardware, for instance, by potting or using glue instead of screws, those sorts of things, it makes it harder for people to hack your device. Now, I know I love to hack my devices, but uh, this isn't about that. Um, you want to reduce electromagnetic emissions, wrap it in foil, uh, just, you know, actually take it and, and put it on the radio range and see what kind of emissions you got because the, the bad guys go out and they, they've got radios and they can tell what your, what your machine is doing by what it's putting out. Um, be wary of GPLv3. You don't absolutely have to, uh, to avoid it, but if you do have GPLv3 code on your machine, you are legally required to accept unverified code from anybody who wants to change your device. So if you do accept unverified code, you might want to actually have a one-time programmable modified flag inside your crypto module. And that would say, you know, it to your services infrastructure, you know, as a packet comes in, you know, that's got the right signed key and everything on it, it would have this flag attached and you'd say, I'm sorry, I can't trust that this packet is actually what it says it is. Um, use Linux security modules. There are a number of them that you can use. Uh, probably the most uh, well-known of them is SE Linux. SE Linux is very good. It's uh, verified by the NSA, National Security Agency, for use in secure machines. Um, it's well supported in uh, most of the Linux infrastructure. It's also the hardest to configure and get it right. And getting it right is very important to security. Uh, next level down would be AppArmor, which is path-based, whereas SE Linux is inode-based. 
Um, one of the problems with embedded systems is a lot of your embedded file systems don't have the extended attributes that are required for SE Linux, whereas a path-based uh, security system such as AppArmor or SMAC uh, just uses the path to the file rather than the actual inode uh, for file uh, access verification. SMAC is simplified mandatory access control kernel. It's um, probably good enough for most applications. It's, it's kind of like flossing your teeth. It doesn't really matter whether you use waxed floss or unwaxed floss. What matters is that you floss. So put in a mandatory access control system. Um, unfortunately, the three main ones here that I've shown are not compatible with each other. They, they use the same concepts and the same LSM modules, but their configuration files are not compatible at all. So if you choose one and then have to switch to another, it's, it's sort of like starting over from a configuration standpoint. There are others, Tomoyo Linux, and, and, and I, there's probably a dozen of them. Um, Linux containers. Um, there was a talk uh, yesterday about namespaces and Linux containers. Uh, so if you want to look at Jake Edge's talk, it was uh, pretty good material. You should plan in the design phase for field updates. If you're, if you're connecting to the internet, you're probably going to have issues at some point you know, with something that you didn't get quite right. Uh, and if you plan for field updating you know, up front, then it's not too painful for you. <coughs> you have a question of push versus pull, but that's a policy decision. Do you want to push stuff out to the device, or do you want to request, require users to, to say, yes, go ahead and give me the latest security? Protect your data. In security circles, they, they have two forms of data. We have data at rest, which is the data that's actually on your device. How it got there is not relevant. Um, and for sensitive data, such as address books or uh, musical or video content, um, you can use an encrypted file system, such as EcryptFS. Uh, but you don't want your device to fall in the wrong hands and, and have easy access to the, those sorts of sensitive data. And then there's data in motion, you know, things that, that come into your device, either from a USB stick or over the network or however you um, access your uh, infrastructure providers. Uh, use secure socket layers, transport level sec uh, security, which is the successor to secure socket layers, uh, IPsec. These are all users of uh, random numbers. So you gotta keep your entropy up to use these. If you don't have enough good entropy in your system, these communication mechanisms will slow way down. Something to be aware of. Uh, development best practices. This is kinda like programming 101, but it's, it, it works. Um, peer reviews, do them. People are, are proud of their work, and they're not going to put something out there for other people to look at and criticize if it's not good. So this forces you to do your best job uh, creating the code. Put comments in your code. I know it's hard for people to do that. You know, the, co the code is, is definitely the last, uh, the last you know, resort. It's, you know, what it does is what the code was written. But... If the comments are not there at all, then it's very hard to review and it's very hard to modify and that becomes a source of vulnerabilities. Use coding standards. And there's Linux coding standard, every large corporation has their own coding standard. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the coding standard is, but if you use it and everybody uses it, then it's a lot easier to follow the code as you start going through unfamiliar code. Basic stuff. Simplicity, there's power in simplicity. You want to keep your, keep your routine small and simple and easy to understand and easy to use. Um, quote from Wikipedia in the vulnerability section that you know, a large source of vulnerabilities is constructs in programming languages, whatever your language is, and not necessarily just C. Um, if they're hard to use, then people will use them incorrectly, and that will create <coughs> holes for hackers to exploit. Randomize. A uh, lot of uh, the, the PAX project has uh, had uh, a number of things accepted into mainline, uh, address-based layout randomization. There are others. They've done some things with bin utils to help harden programs. 
Um, you know, go out to the PACS website and look at it. Uh, as I mentioned, keep your entropy up. Enroll IRQs that are based on uh, random events such as keyboards and network events and so on. Don't enroll your tick. It's not random. Uh, there was an interesting project called Have GED that um, it created entropy out of the variations in cache, you know, how, how the access patterns in cache change. Uh, and it, it, it actually turned out to be a good source of en entropy. Um, don't mess with the PAX penguin. Test your system. You know, it's basic stuff. You need to plan. Have a QA plan. Write it down. Test your error paths. So a lot of code is tested in the main, but you end up not really covering a lot of uh, unusual conditions. And you can bet that a hacker who's trying to penetrate your system, he's going to start typing with his left elbow and you know, spin in circles and do random things. And if you see something unusual, he's going to say, oh, OK, well, let's, let's do that again. If I can reproduce it, maybe there's a hole there. And that's how things are found. Do coverage analysis. See how good your test uh, coverage is. GCOV is a good tool there, a free tool. If I'm going too fast, let me know. I'm just, I'm not sure what my time left is. Got about 15 minutes. Um, there are a lot of static analysis tools that are available, both free and for pay. Your primary first line of defense should be the compiler. It's basic. Um, there are flags you can set in your comp compiler, wformat and wformat security, that will check your format strings for vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the basic vulnerabilities is if you don't have a format statement in your, in your input, um, then somebody can put in a percent %s as a part of their input, and the, um, the library will interpret that as a format. And that's how one of the ways that, that m malicious code gets injected into your system. Um, you know, check, obviously, check your inputs, make sure they're in bounds. Those sorts of things are all pretty basic. Um, the compiler has fstack protector, which can put, uh, put canaries in your stack to detect stack smashing attacks uh, and, and create an error if it detects, uh, if it detects a stack overflow. Uh, defortif uh, define fortify source. Um, that will put in checks for your buffers, for buffer overflow attacks. Uh, Wikipedia, the, the, the Google and the network are your friend. There's a list of tools for static code analysis on the wiki. It's very extensive. I'll show you just a few. Um, there's your basic lint and, and uh, Java lint and uh, PyLint and so on. Um, you've got uh, the bash checker, so your script checker, uh, the C language checker, uh, Yaska, which is a, a security checking framework that uh, has pluggable modules. Um, there's, there's quite a few um, for pay static analysis tools from Black Duck and Coverity, Clockwork, Rational, and, and others. So depending on you know, your, your financing and, and the uh, level of man management support that you get, um, those, are, those are all good tools as well. There are dynamic analysis tools. So for memory management, you've got DMALIC, Electric Fence, MTrace, MPatrol. Um, Valgrind is a, a very good tool. It's a, an emulator uh, that emulates your machine. Of course, as an emulator, uh, your hardware might perhaps do things that are not anticipated by Valgrind, so it's not uh, guaranteed to find everything, but it's a very good way to get um, a lot of data about uh, uh, what your program is doing, and uh, uh, if you examine the output, you might find things that you didn't expect. Uh, Avalanche, Glassbox, Gperf tools, JRAT, so, so some of these are performance uh, analyzers. Some are uh, for security vulnerabilities. And again, the, the commercial ones, Purify and Rational, both have uh, dynamic analysis tools. 
glass box is a, or no, avalanche is an interesting one. It, it goes and it tries to create inputs and, uh, and find error paths. And so it, it creates uh, files that it calls the input of death. So when it finds an input com combination that, that crashes your program, it'll, it'll save it off for you. And it, it actually goes in and you know, branches out and finds lots of interesting things um, in your, it's an automated uh, testing tool. Before you deploy, you got to do your checklist. You want to close all the ports that you had open, you know, all your Telnet ports and SSH and uh, your serial port, you know, the things that you really don't want people to be using in their device. Uh, limit as much access as you can. Uh, remove all the debug in the, and the little hacks that you put in so it makes it easier to get into your system and, and test it. Uh, that all needs to be removed before you deploy. Don't assume obscurity will protect you. Uh, security by obscurity is, is uh, um, well proven not to, not to work. Um, run the tools that hackers use. Go out and you know, run, run the port scans. Run uh, Metasploit or the, the, uh, the, the GUI version called Armitage. These are free tools. The hackers are using them. John the Ripper, check your passwords. Now, not all devices have passwords, but if you do, these are good things to do. There are many, many more tools. Any, security, any good security site will have a, a bunch of those that you can use. Hire a professional. If, if your device is, is valuable and, and your, your expected revenue will cover the cost of it, uh, hire somebody to do a penetration test or a pen test, as they call them. You know, a hacker that can possibly either go in cold, which costs you more money, or you can tell him, this is what my system does and this is how it does it, can you get in? Um, and they will often find a, a way, and you know, that gives you more information on what to close. There's uh, this month, earlier, a few weeks ago, security researchers found uh, a hack into the uh, file for industrial control system that's used by military, hospitals, uh, factories that does surveillance and alarms and door locks. I mean, what a great thing for spy. You know, all I gotta do is, is do this hack and I can get into your building and you don't even know it. Um, the interesting thing was the company last year, late last year, said it believed attacks on its system were unlikely because the systems were obscure and hackers don't traditionally target this. Well, that was probably like waving a red flag in front of a bull, but you know, the, the, the lesson is clear, I think. Do not rely on obscurity. Um, hackers will, will come in and they'll find their way in and you won't know about it until you know, something bad happens because of it. You know, and that's what's called the window of vulnerability. Um, the, the, from the time that they find it until the time that you find out about it is, is called the zero day. So it's... Uh, very difficult problem. Every system has faults. Perfection is not possible. Don't count on your system being perfect when you ship it. Um, you need to follow the lists. Um, there's quite a few. The uh, National Vulnerability Database that NIST puts out, exploitdb.com, securitytracker.com, those are all real good resources for finding uh, problems. And you need to analyze them, of course, and say, does this issue apply to my system, but if it does, you need to deploy your fixes proactively. Um, you or the distro that you base on should be following CVEs and providing fixes. Um, they all, uh, the, the security community reports vulnerabilities when they're found to cve.mitre.org. Um, generally, MITRE uh, will embargo the actual details for a period of time, maybe a week or maybe a little bit more, depending, um, to give the distributions time to come up with a fix for it. So the distros actually have access to that information. I guess if you work for a big enough company, you probably have access to it as well. Um, another good source of information, ossecurity.openwall.org has a security wiki for Linux. It's got a lot of really good information on it. So a little bit about attacks. So we have uh, 
timing attacks, which is a crypto module, a cryptographic algorithm, um, takes a various amount of time depending on, uh, for instance, the number of ones in the key. And so by checking how long does it take to encrypt a certain cipher, a certain clear text, it, can, you can, it will leak information about your keys. So the more information that a hacker can, can get about your key, the closer he is to cracking it. Uh, there are fault attacks. Um, so you can induce faults in computers, it's well known. Uh, alpha particles, um, you can induce eddy currents using electromagnets, you can uh, uh, heat it up. You know, the semiconductors don't work well at high temperatures. Um, the RSA algorithm, if you have you know, a, a, um, a certain ciphertext with a known good output, uh, a, a certain clear text with a known ciphertext output, and then you can induce a, a fault in that that gives you a different ciphertext output, and a few of those, and you can actually crack the key. Just a few, doesn't take many. Um, similar to timing attacks, the, you can power analysis. The, the algorithms use different amounts of power based on uh, the key and the, and the clear text. Port scans, um, you know, there are lots of, lots of ports uh, and there are bots out there scanning ports all the time. There are denial of service attacks where uh, you don't really care if you compromise your system, you just keep it from doing any useful work. Um, and then escalation of privilege attacks. The defense uh, for timing attacks, you need to either randomize, you know, put some random things into your encryption algorithm or standardize your timing so that everything takes about the same amount of time regardless of the input. Uh, for fault attacks, uh, tamper detection module is a, is a good thing. Um, there, there, it, can do, it can detect physical, did, did somebody, you know, dissolve the cap on the, on the SOC? Uh, is somebody glitching your power or your clock? Uh, radiation, things like ions and alpha particles and uh, you know even photons, you can put detectors in that will detect such things. Temperature, uh, over temp conditions, eddy currents, these are all possible to detect. You know, if, if you've got enough money, you can put lots of things in there. Um, with enough money, uh, redundancy is a good uh, check against a fault attack if you get you know, if you have two parallel pieces that are doing the same thing and they come up with the same result, there's a good chance that it hasn't been tampered with. Uh, power analysis attacks, again, randomization inside your crypto module. Port scans, just close your ports. That's, that's gotta be on your checklist before you go out the door. Uh, denial of service attacks, use things like C groups and quotas to keep uh, runaway programs in, you know, it doesn't even have to be malicious. I mean, programs sometimes get run away, you know, just because they have a bug in them. Um, by limiting the amount of CPU or the amount of disk space or various resources that they use, that lets you uh, limit uh, the denial of service. And to uh, combat escalation of privilege attacks, uh, mandatory access control systems, uh, use containers, uh, analytics containers, or in other words, namespaces for that. Um, what am I doing on time? Well, I'm just about out. I, you know, want to give me another five minutes and I'll go real quick through this. This is the kind of things that, that is more uh, in line with information security systems and for high value uh, things such as automobiles, uh, EV systems, things like that. Um, you have your, your CIA triad. I just thought it was a cool graphic, but uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability are the three cornerstones of information security. Um, we, we use a security methodology. Um, you, you start out by defining what are your assets? What are you protecting? What is, what is key on your system to protect? Um, and then you define the threats to those assets. And that helps to define your security strategy. And then you take those threats and you categorize them using, uh, there's a Microsoft methodology called Stride and Dread. Um, and Geneva is using uh, the TVRA method, the Threat Vulnerability and Risk Analysis. 
from the, uh, the European uh, Telecommunication Standards Institute. Um, STRIDE stands for the, the various categories, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, dis information disclosure, denial of service, and escalation of privilege. DREAD is what you use to category the, categorize the, the effect of a vulnerability. What is the potential for damage? Uh, how reproducible is it? Uh, if you can reproduce it, how exploitable is it? How many users are affected by it? If it's one versus everybody, uh, and, and how discoverable is it? I, how obscure is it? So um, the typical method would be assign a value between zero and five for each of these, zero and 10 for each of these, add them up and divide by five. Um, so the Geneva Automotive Consortium uses the ETSI uh, TVRA method, which is similar to Stride and Dread. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, alternative um, so I can go over that. I was going to show uh, an example of some of the categorization that we had in Geneva, but I didn't. Uh, it's on my other laptop. So questions? Now this, this talk, um, the, I uploaded a prior version of it uh, for, the, uh, for the website. So this, this exact talk is not there. I'm assuming they'll let me upload this one. Um, you know, post after the, after the conference. But uh, if anybody really wants a copy of this, just drop me a business card and I'll, I'll send you a copy. Uh, I'm also going to upload it to the Geneva site if you have access to that. Sorry, it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose. As I said, I, I intended this to be sort of a, uh, a reference material for people who want to dig deeper. Um, certainly, if you have questions, feel free to contact me. And uh, if there are no questions for the broader group, then thank you very much for your attention.